All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for the MindCore seminar series. Um, this, the theme for this year is big unanswered questions about the mind, and you'll find that today's speaker um, is talking about one of the big questions around consciousness. Um, I would just like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. One is if you have a question, please post it in the ask a question option uh, at the bottom of the screen. And uh, questions there can be upvoted by other attendees. And I think that's it. Those are our only housekeeping matters. So I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Lisa Meraki to introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure today to welcome Lucia Meloni. She is a research professor at the Department of Neurology at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. And she's also a W2 group leader with tenure at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in the Department of Neuroscience. She uh, received her BA and PhD in psychology from Catholic University in Chile. And her work is wide ranging on a variety of topics. She's done really interesting work on cortical computations, on perceptual processing, linguistic processing, memory. Um, but today we're going to uh, hear from her about this wonderful project that she's been working on, getting uh, consciousness researchers to collaborate with each other. And she has this really exciting concept of uh, adversarial collaboration, where she's working on helping researchers come to some sort of common agreement about how science, uh, scientific evidence can uh, help us tell for or against certain theories of consciousness. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome Lucia Meloni. Thank you, Lisa, for this nice introduction. Let me put up my slides. Um, can you see that, guys? Is that OK? I hope um, so. I, oh, yes. Yeah? Okay, we you can see, see you. Okay. Great. Great. So um, as Lisa was, so first of all, I want to thank Lisa and Heather and and Jessica for inviting me to this uh, lecture series. When I saw this, the other speakers and the topics, I thought, oh my God, what am I going to say about this? Because you have really heard interesting people. But then when Lisa told me, why don't you talk about this project that you are um, that you have embarked on? And I thought, you know what? This is probably the good audience to talk about this, um, and, but also the good audience to get the, the competitive idea. So why do you think that this is a bad project? And I, and I would really be interested in also listening, hearing from you why this could probably not uh, be the, the right answer. Um, and this project is actually, it's a, it's a large scale question. I'm gonna introduce you later on uh, all of the different participants because I am just the visible face for this project, but this is many more people than myself. And I hope to introduce you to them you know, through the talk. But I wanna first start by actually thanking, uh, very often we scientists start with our own ideas um, and then you know, we go to funding agencies to get money to do what we think is important. Well, this project actually started the way around. It was the Templeton World Charity Foundation that actually launched a really in interesting initiative called Accelerating Research on Consciousness. This is led by uh, the president, uh, Andrew Saracen, and David Podkitter, the program officer. And they came up with this idea of using the mechanism of adversarial collaboration and open science to try and determine which theories of consciousness have more predictive power. And this is how actually got, all got started. Um, so I really wanna thank them to, for being so visionaries in you know, pushing the finger in the right, on the right spot. Um, but now let's go back to why consciousness is so important. Um, for sure, it remains one of the biggest, most controversial and most controversial scientific mysteries of our times. Um, but I wanna, I wanna start with the stories that I hope that it will illustrate why studied consciousness is so important, why it's so challenging. And I want to take you back to 20 years ago in my own life. Um, I was starting my PhD and I received a phone call and it was uh, from the hospital. And it just happened that my brother-in-law had had an accident. And when I got to the hospital, I actually understood that the diagnosis was brain death. What that means is that the doctor tells you there is nobody there. And it's a really, really disconcerting experience, you know, when you see somebody um, under that circumstance. Um, and so then I entered the room, I tried to say goodbye, and then he moves. And I was really thinking, well, is he there? And I just couldn't tell, right? He was just moving, even though everyone was telling me that he wasn't there. In that night, I just fell asleep and I started dreaming with him. 
So it was absolutely intense. And I was wrestling with my thoughts and, you know, like trying to say goodbye and reviving this, this very difficult day that I had had. Um, and I can tell you for sure that it felt very intense. And it felt that I was definitely there. But now the question for you is, how do you, Central Observer, can tell who of us is actually there? I, in my sleep, I'm completely paralyzed. I'm not moving. So from the outside perspective, you might say, well, she's not there. Him, on the other end, is moving. He's in a hospital bed, but he's moving. So you may say, well, he is there. And this is a conundrum. So I can tell you for certain that, and people told me that he wasn't there. Um, so I'm sharing you this story because it really shows how challenging it is to study consciousness. But also why understanding it is so important because it really has you know, societal consequences, ethical consequences, medical consequences. People like him you know, get, go into a different faith or people who are in coma go into a different faith if one thinks that somebody is aware or is conscious or not. So we really want to know the answer to this question. It's not just uh, you know, mental exercise. That we want to, it really impacts our life on a daily basis. And Lisa is, for instance, working on one of those interesting problems. So, I'm, are machine conscious or not? Are brain organoids conscious or not? So, we're, ma we're making decisions based on that. However, there is, there is basic answers that we still don't, don't know. That we, 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 there, there's, excuse me, basic questions for which we still don't know the answer. Why certain activity in the brain makes us conscious and why certain activity doesn't make us conscious? Um, why do we lose or gain it? Um, how do we know whether someone or something is conscious? We still don't know that, right? And these are the questions that we are really trying to understand and that we hope that any program on consciousness will at, will at some point be able to give them the answers for. Now, let me take you back to this journey of, you know, for most people who do psychology, we try to do like really clever experiments to try and understand um, whether someone has language, whether someone has working memory, a trial allow, we try to measure that. Well, consciousness is this very interesting aspect because we know that it's there for us. Like I can tell you for sure now that I am having this moment. You might not know it. You might not know how intense it is. You might not know how colorful it is, but it is there for me and I cannot deny it. That's the part that makes it private, but I can tell you for sure it's there, right? It's direct. I don't have to you know, like think about it to then recognize, oh, am I conscious or am I not? It's just there. I don't need any measurement device. I know that it is, and when I fall asleep or when I have anesthesia, I know that I'm not there. You know? And it's experience. And um, it's this, this sense of, you know, when I drink a nice bottle of wine, it you know, tastes really nicely, but it doesn't necessarily have to really be observable. Like, take my dreams. I, you know, they can be very, very, very intense for me that they're just experience, but in the, there's, there's no behavior associated with those. Right. So now from the perspective, this is all clear. We don't need measurement devices. Things are there. Things are private. Now, this poses a huge challenge for us as scientists. Right. Because while I know and I'm certain about my experience as scientists, and that's the question what I asked that I posed you before at the very introduction of my talk. How do we know that someone else is having an experience? Because science is always about third person perspective. So at the end, we rely on observables, some kind of report that people give us. So for instance, you know, like I ask you, are you conscious or not? Um, but of course, it's not a perfect tool, right? So for instance, let me give you an example. Um, there's people who actually have color graphemes in anesthesia. So they see the world, or the letters in particular, with particular colors. So they would see, for instance, this text with every letter would be a very colorful text, right? For us, who are not a color graphene synesthet, we see the world this way, right? So now I ask, and both of us will pass. But, but of course, the experience of the synesthet is of this sort, and my experience is of that sort. So it's very different, right? And if I don't ask the question on the color, I will not get right that they are seen differently. So we have to become very, very, very clever in asking the questions at the, at the specific scale at which you know, we can understand whether someone is having an experience or not. Now, for, for, because of the subjectivity gap and you know, the, um, the reliance on behaviorism, consciousness was a topic that was very much a taboo for many, 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 many years. Uh, but then, um, in the 1990s, Christoph Koch and Francis Crick, um, they published a really seminal paper called Towards a Neurobiological Theory of Consciousness. 
where they lay out a program of research rather than any detailed model for what consciousness was or the mechanism, but a detailed model for how to do research to understand and to, uh, and to grasp what kind of neural mechanisms could give rise to, the, to an experience. And they said, why don't, because of the different challenges that we have, the subjectivity gap and et cetera, why don't we try to start the program with something simple? Let's just focus on the so-called neural correlates, which in this case is defined as a set of minimal neural events that are jointly sufficient for a specific conscious experience. And they envisage something like this. So imagine that you know, you're, and there's neurons in your brain that every time you see a dog, they just generate higher spikes. Then they would say, this is a correlate of consciousness. And so from that moment on, they really set up, they, 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 they create a huge ripple in the field. And you can I just pulled this up you know, yesterday from PubMed, where you can see in 1990, how many papers were published on the term consciousness, awareness, and neural. And there's something like 16. Now you can see the nice, the nice ra racing curve. Well, now in 2010, in 2020, we have something like 500 published. So they really made a huge impact. And, and the idea was really simple, if you think about it. So they thought, imagine I present the stimulus, and sometimes a subject sees it, and sometimes a subject doesn't see it. And then I asked them, please, can you press a button or move your eyes or tell me that you saw it or, or what have you, so then you can have access to a report. And then the idea was very simple. So you just contrast your insertion idea. You contrast the trials in which subject says, I perceive or I am aware with the ones where the subject says, I don't perceive, I'm not aware, right? And what is left is this miraculous activity that gives rise to consciousness. It sounds simple, right? Well, in the past 30 years, psychologists have perfected their arsenal of techniques that allows them to manipulate conscious versus unconscious um, uh, scenarios. They have, for instance, developed continuous flash suppression. It's a really interesting technique. You put one stimulus to one eye, another stimulus to the other eye. One is very high intensity, and because of that, you suppress a stimulus that otherwise could have been absolutely uh, visible. And then you remove that high intensity activity, and then the, the stimulus becomes visible. So now you can contrast situations of visibility versus invisibility. You can do the same with the so-called binocular rivalry. Again, you put one stimulus to one eye, one stimulus to the other eye, and because the brain works such that it wants to have only one interpretation, it actually goes back and forth between these two. So then you can contrast what happens when you saw, for instance, in this case, a face versus when you saw a house. Or uh, the, a technique called mask. You put you know, a, a stimulus in between, uh, two, um, two stimulus, one before and one after, and because you kind of like sandwich the activity, you can't, uh, the, the subject cannot see it. And depending on the temporal uh, distance between the two stimulus, you can actually present the very same stimulus for the very same duration, and the subject would see it. So then you can contrast scene versus unseen. Uh, and there is another format, you know, like called attentional blink. I'm just, you know, like making a case for, we have perfected our arsenal of psychological tests. That's not the problem. And in fact, um, we, ha we have also discovered a number of neural correlates. And I'm going to just show you two for the sake of the argument and also um, you know, to demonstrate how different the, the, um, the, uh, the findings are. But these are just two out of you know, like the thousands that we have. You know, like Im imagine that you know, we have something like 600 per year. Like how many, <laughs> how many studies have been done uh, uh, over the decades on, on this topic? Yeah, I just pick up one, which is by one of my you know, very talented PhD students, Jan Aru. And what Jan did was presented, he presented images that subjects can either see very, because they are very clear, or, the, or he actually put some noise, so then subjects could not see them. And he, took, uh, and he took advantage of a technique, or not a technique, but there is subjects that have incurable epilepsy. And when they have incurable epilepsy, their brains have to be monitored with invasive electrodes. So it's the only time when we can actually see the brain from the inside. Otherwise, we have access to only techniques from the outside of the brain. So then in this case, um, the, the neurosurgeon implanted electrodes in the so-called fusiform face area, which is this particular area of the brain that is very sensitive to faces. You show faces, it lights up. You show houses, it's silent. You show um, you know, letters, it's silent. You, you show anything else, it's silent, only faces. And then he asked the subjects, okay, do you see a face or do you not see a face? And he sorted the trials with this contrastive method. And what you can see here is that this particular area, the fusiform face area, has a strong difference between when subjects see a stimulus versus when subjects don't see a stimulus. So you could say, well, that's a correlate. So this is an area that must be important for consciousness. Let me give you another example. This is with binocular rivalry. 
So now you present one, one, uh, one stimulus to one eye, one, one stimulus to the other eye, and you ask the subjects, please tell me when you see one versus the other. So red, blue, red, blue. Except that in this case, this wasn't done with humans, but it was done with monkeys. Um, and it was done, the, the researchers inserted electrodes in the prefrontal cortex and monitored the activity in that neuron while the monkey was reporting seeing one stimulus or the other. And what they found is, in this case, let's concentrate on the red uh, curve, which is the so-called like, preferred stimulus. So this is the, 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 the stimulus that the neurons like. And what you can see is that when the, sub, when the monkey is seeing the monkey, the monkey image, which prefers, which is the red one, it's you know, spiking very, very much. Then moves to the other image, it's silent. And in the other case, it happens the same. It, it happens the opposite. So another neuron that prefers um, the, uh, the, the phase stimulus, it will be high when it sees the, the phase stimulus, and it will be low uh, when it sees uh, the other stimulus. So again, we now see that the prefrontal cortex also makes a difference for consciousness. And it's very clear, as you can see here. Now, around the 2010 or so, when, when Jan was doing his PhD, we started becoming suspicious because there were like just way too many studies that would give that there was always a difference, you know. So you you would contrast seeing an unseen stimulus. There was always some area of the brain that would light up, and then we thought, how you know why is that? Why is that diversity? Is there something wrong with the method? Or is there just the whole brain actually something to do with consciousness? And then we actually realized that the method that we had been using, which is the so-called contrastive method or contrastive analysis, actually had a problem. Um, and, and the problem is the following. It's very simple when you think about it. it the, the contrastive methods rest on the idea of pure insertion, meaning that the only thing that changes is consciousness. The problem is, is that, Lisa, are you there? Um, the, the, the problem I, is, yeah. I am here. I'm hearing a background noise yeah. too. Um, That's all right. I, I just thought you had a question. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, no. no. Um, Okay, so the the um, the assumption that we have is this idea of pure insertion, right? But if you can think about like, um, it, our speaker lost connection for a minute. Let's see. Can you hear me? I I can hear you, Lucia. Ah, it just okay. Seems like yeah, okay. it just seems like there's a little bit of background noise. Um, all right, but... okay. So should I go on? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, all right. So the the as I was saying, the you know if we believe in the idea of pure insertion, the only thing that we have changed is consciousness. But if you think so about, so we it, just can't see her. Um, so that's okay. I think uh, we did. Do, do you see slides? Heather, I think something may be uh, difficult on your end because I think we can hear and see Lucia and her slides. That's fine, just go ahead. Should we go on, guys? Or... Let me try. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so Okay, good, good, go ahead. Yes, please, okay. thanks. Um, all right, so the, the, as, I, as I was saying, um, the, the idea of your insertion might actually be slightly off because if you think about it, you know, the whole idea of, you know, I present your stimulus at threshold and sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't, begs the question, what activity in the brain led the stimulus to be seen versus not? So this means that it must have been precursors of that activity in the brain that led the, the brain to see it or not. And this is what we saw, what we call like the precursors of consciousness. And those are hope that those are you know non-sufficient conditions, but that nonetheless contribute to consciousness. And you can think about the, the, the next problem, which is probably even more problematic, which is the so-called like NCC consequences. And we know that this, you know, in some sense is the case. Um, because we know that whatever theory that attributes a function to consciousness will say that you know if you are conscious, then some some activity was mediated by that experience. So for instance, episodic memories seem to actually be related to consciousness. We can form memories if we have been conscious. But we know at the same time from cases such as HM that you can remove the whole hippocampus or the middle temporal lobe and that person will remain conscious but will lose the memories, right? So what we found, what we realized at that point was that this method was in some sense a little bit messy because it would give us the NCC precursors the NCC consciousness and the NCC that are real. And we couldn't really tell. 
And so we thought, okay, that's a real problem. And it could explain why we have so many different results. And one of the solutions that we proposed back in the day was rely on conjunction. What does that mean? It's like, you know, you try to change the conditions by which a stimulus enter into awareness. So sometimes, you know, you change attention, sometimes you change working memory, expectations, and sometimes you change which consequences. So sometimes, you know, subjects will have to lay down memory, sometimes they don't. And the idea was to rely on what is the main difference or a conjunction of all of those differences. And back in the day, there was nothing like neurosynth, uh, neurosynth nothing like that. Um, so we thought, okay, this is gonna talk an enterprise is gonna be forever because we are going to do like thousands of experiments to try and understand what is the conjunction among all of the different variables that we could ever possibly manipulate. Um, if you look at neurosynth, just to give you a, an idea, you find some areas, but of course, the, the, uh, there, is, there is a problem. First of all, we don't know where, which uh, stimulus have been manipulated, nor, have the, nor, nor the consequences. So strategies such as this will not really help us. The second idea that we proposed back in the day was to rely on theories. We said, well, you know, there, you know we have, theories have been developed now. So it's not that we, you know, there are people that have no idea about, you know, what could uh, mediate consciousness. There is ideas, and, um, you know, I'm here mentioning three of those, colonial workspace, recurrent processing, integrated information theory, there's more. So we thought maybe the, uh, the strategy that is more fruitful is the opposite. Let's rely on theories, test their predictions, and then see how far we can go with a the theory. And I'm gonna walk you through some of the theories so then you'll see also how different they are. Um, so one theory is the uh, global neural workspace theory and, and proposes that consciousness is, um, is this capacity to actually share information across many processors in the brain. And the idea here would be that when information is unconscious, encapsulated, in the specific modules. And to break that encapsulation, we need something like a global sharing, a broadcasting uh, mechanism. And the, in global workspace, this is associated with neurons which have long range connections in particular areas that connect prefrontal and parietal cortex with sensory input and the cingulate, which are, hope, which are thought to be um, hosted in layers two, three. And that those are the new that allow for this distribution of information and therefore mediate consciousness. Um, and there's a beautiful uh, review paper by Manchur Neuron uh, from 20 years uh, of um, global neural workspace findings. And those actually go along these lines. So as you see, this, I just pick up two of those where um, on the uh, left-hand side, you see what happens in the brain when, for instance, you see a word versus when you don't see a word. And you can see there's this uh, massive patterns of activation in prefrontal areas and in parietal cortex when subjects see a word versus almost no activity, very encapsulated in the, in the uh, back of the brain when subjects don't see a word. And this is the same thing that also happens with, when a subject uh, s uh, hear a sound. So now in this case, you would, you would see again, like this very strong frontal parietal activation when uh, the subjects detect the sound, but if they don't perceive the sound, that activity will remain very much localized, right? So for this theory, having this broadcasting in these particular areas frontal parietal is the key for consciousness. Now in recurrent processing, the, the uh, hypothesis is actually very different. The idea is that the only thing that is necessary for phenom phenomenological awareness is real rate and activity in the back of the brain. So in this case, in areas within, say, the, uh, the visual cortex. While they take that activity that goes into prefrontal cortex is for, you know, like how that information can be used. But this is not, nece it's not necessary for consciousness. It can be done, but it's absolutely not necessary for consciousness. And they have also uh, amazed a number of really interesting findings over the years, doing causal manipulations, recordings in monkeys, um, fMRI, EMG, like I'm here uh, giving you some, uh, uh, some examples. But the bottom line is that, again, if subjects see a stimulus, there is increase in this recurrent activity, right? That is only circumscribed to um, sensory cortices and not to the frontal areas. Then there is another theory, integrated information theory, this is a very different theory from the others, because contrary to the other ones that start from either behavior or neural correlates, this theory starts from phenomenology. And what it does is that it first of all identifies what it calls like the basic properties of every, every experience, and, and actually singles out five of them. Intrinsic existence, compositionality, information, integration, and exclusion. And, and the idea here is that these are the minimal, the bare minimum, for any experience to arise. So it has to have, it has to exist. It has to be for myself. It has to, it has to be informative. So now for instance, I'm, see, I'm hearing something as opposed to not. It has to be, it has to have composition. So things are, um, they have structure. 
it has to be integrated. You know, so there's a, a left and a right and a right hand side, but they are all into one thing, and and it has to contain only what it has now and not nothing more, nothing else. Um, and then what is uh, um, very interesting about this theory is that it says, okay, start with these axioms that every experience should have, and then it derives the so-called postulates that any physical system has to satisfy in order to have that experience. Um, and then the idea here is that any experience is a so-called conceptual structure. So there is a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between my consciousness and a conceptual structure, and that reflects my phenomenology. So things that are similar in phenomenological space are similar in this conceptual space. And from there, they derive, uh, uh, the, the, from there, there is a relationship to the physical systems. And the idea here is that um, an, an NCC is a maximum of the so-called like, cost effect power. Right, so how much a system can have powers on itself? So how much is passivity uh, uh, circumscribe or constrict the current moment, and how much the current moment circumscribe uh, or constrict the future moment? So in that sense, it can actually test its own uh, existence. Um, and they have developed really interesting methods to uh, probe, so to speak, how the um, how the brain reacts by uh, combining TMS, which is like a, a magnetic pulse in the, that you can give. From the outside with EEG, so then you can they can they can look at how much activity um, uh, or how much the brain responds to this thing, so to speak. And what they observe is that integration is high and information is high when subjects are awake. It's also high when subjects are in non-REM sleep, which is when we dream and we are we feel that we are there. But it's very low in cases when subjects have non-REM sleep and we kind of like think that we are not there, right? So there is evidence also for this theory. Now. Now, the problem when you know when you think about this is like, okay, so if we rely on theories now, how do we know which theories are right? And how do we know which theories actually are truth? They, they hold a truth. We really don't have a, a standard procedure to derive the, that decision process. And furthermore, there's a strong confirmation bias. So we usually test to you usually tend to confirm our postulates as opposed to stress test our ideas. And you can see this in a very simple, um, you know, something that occurs in, in the consciousness research, but it occurs in almost every other uh, field of studies, that theories develop in parallel. They just test their postulates. And then at the very end of the process, if anything, in the discussion section, they say like, oh, and my results are actually incompatible with what blah, blah, blah. But they never really test one against each other. Furthermore, and this is on a larger note, um, most of the, the, the problem that we have is that if we don't have a way to know what is true or what theories are more predictive, uh, then you can also ask yourself, like, are we using the, the, the resources in science um, rationally? Are we investing properly? Are we not wasting resources because we are investing in theories that probably they have no uh, predictive power? But also you could say, well, if you don't share your data, then you cannot even know where your data are, whether your theory is right or wrong. Um, and this is actually something that, you know, when, when we proposed this idea of uh, this, this whole idea to go for the uh, 3NCC problem, was to look at all of the different research that was done, but people don't share their data. So we actually, we couldn't really do it. The only way to do it is, you know, by doing it through a meta-analysis, but that's not the same as really having access to the data itself. And now the question is, why are we not opening access to everyone to that knowledge? Um, and just to give you one uh, piece of uh, information, so there, there is a, the, the Bioinformatics Institute actually evaluated how much money could be saved by reusing data. And they calculated this in the order of 1.3 billion a year. Just to give you an estimate of, you know, why it's so necessary that we actually do this. Um, but finally, the next point that we have is the so-called reprodu reproducibility crisis, right? Um, and this, this was, um, there was a very provocative paper in 2005 by John Leonides, where he said that most published papers are just false, right? And then the, the, this actually came, um, it became true in some sense, when this was tested. So there were 100 experiments that uh, were tried to be replicated, and actually only a number of those were possible to be replicated. And this has led to a number of initiatives, uh, like such as, for instance, Greenway, which is tries to look for reproducible science. So in essence, we really have a severe problem in the field of consciousness, for sure, we, can, we don't know how to how to evaluate which theories are uh, right and which theories are wrong. We don't have access to the data, and we know that in general, where science has this problem with reproducibility. Now, is this only limited to consciousness? No. But 
I think that you know we can make use or we can or we can uh, change our field by making use of certain practices. And this is where the idea of the or of the um, Templeton Foundation uh, is so it's so interesting because now we have an opportunity to accelerate our understanding of consciousness. And to achieve this, we're going to pursue what we call a very transformative approach. And our approach is, on the one hand, based on the so-called adversarial collaboration. The idea is to now, you take two theories, you try to make the adversaries to, co to uh, collaborate, they have to derive predictions from their theories, and only one of them can actually win. And by doing that, you materialize the elimination processes of theories that are not as predictive as others. Now, the second aspect of this initiative is that we want to create large, reproducible, transparent, and open data to actually drive trustworthy science. And the last part is that we want to encourage global participation. We want to untap in your knowledge, in your expertise later on. And so where are we starting? Um, in my project, we are, com we are comparing only two different theories, global neural workspace and integrated information theory. I, I hope that I was able to show you before that these theories are actually very different, and not only in what they understand consciousness is. So for one is a uh, broadcaster and it's, an, it's in a message, for the other one is uh, as a structure, um, but also in the, even the, the areas in the brain that participate in consciousness, one puts a very uh, a strong weight on prefrontal areas and on parietal areas, whereas the other theory puts a stronger weight in posterior, uh, in posterior areas. So they actually have, um, they, they, they have clear predictions by which one theory is, should be right and the other theory should be wrong and the other way around. Um, so we have teamed up with the adversaries, in this case, Stanislas de Han and Julio Tonomi. Uh, we put together opposing predictions, we derive experiments, but then on top of that, um, we, are, we are using the so-called multi-scale, multi-model approach. Um, what does that mean? In, in a, it's a fancy word, but in simple, it means that we are using invasive techniques. So these electrodes that I showed you before inserted in the brain, as well as non-invasive techniques, in this case, fMRI and magnetoencephalography combined with EEG to get to a comprehensive view as to what the brain is doing when uh, we uh, present the stimulus in these experiments that I will tell you later on. Um, uh, third, um, we are also using highly powered studies. We are testing over 500 subjects, which we think is one of the, it's going to be one of the largest data sets that, we're going to be that, that would have been collected with these multimodal data sets in the field of consciousness. Four, we also have identified identical standardized study protocols that every lab will run. And fifth, which is also very important, we have a so-called inbuilt replication. What that means is that we're going to analyze first 50% of the data. We're going to have held out data, the other 50%. And then we're going to see how much what we have found out in the 50%, in the first 50% um, replicates for the, with the other 50% uh, uh, that was completely held out and nobody knew about. And last but not least, which is actually I think is also very important about this particular initiative is that we have, uh, we are, leveraging team science, but we're leveraging on an impartial set of experts, labs around the world that will conduct experiments, analyze the data and report the results. So the adversaries give the predictions, the adversaries uh, help in designing the experiments, but the data themselves and the analysis themselves are not conducted by them. And in this way, we prevent any, any kind of biases that maintain the results. So where are we standing? Um, we have we have the team together line up. Um, so this is uh, uh, this is the central team: Liad uh, Liad Mudrik, Michael Pitts, Diana uh, Mikmorus. Who you know we fought together. We work really you know intensively to try to put this long this, this long and large team together in conjunction with the adversaries, Julie Tononi and Stanislas de Han and their uh, and their students, as well as the the so-called IMG team. In this case, Juan Lu and Ole Jensen and his and their students. The fMRI team. Um, Hal Blumenfeld and Soris de Lange and their team, uh, and the ACOG team is composed of Gabriel Kramen and Sasha Davor. Also, we have a neuroinformatic team composed of um, uh, Sean Hill and Daniel Marcus, and a nice uh, a set of advisors who actually tell us you know, what kind of methods we, uh, or, or somehow guide us through this process of you know, finding the, the most uh, reliable methods. So um, what, what we have done so far is we have identified the predictions, we have defined experiments, and we have set up the um, decision trees, so to speak, for how to interpret data at the end of the, the data collection and when the data are analyzed. And in this way, we, we think that we can materialize the so-called elimination process because we have now 
cases for success or for failures for each of the theories, and those are incompatible. So at the end of the day, only one theory will have stronger support as compared to the other. Um, we have device experiments. One of those is a video game uh, that, that uh, we have developed. It's been a very laborious and intense project. Uh, and you know we hope that it will yield uh, interesting data and it will open up a new opportunities for, for research in the field of consciousness as well in monotheistic scenarios. Um, we have pre-registered this and the idea is to really go transparent. So you will know what happens in this project from day zero. And we hope that you know we are going to have versioning of whatever we are we're doing such that every one of you can when we change something and why. And we and as I told you, we actually have the money, right? But I believe that this project will not be or, or will fall short if we only keep the data for ourselves and if we only tap on the team that we have now. What we are hoping is in a to tap on the on the community. We want to make all of the data that we have generated available the methods that we are using, the protocols, the brain imaging data, analysis tools, the video game, the et cetera, so that you guys can actually also profit from this uh, very high quality data set and, and, and a large number of subjects. And with this, what we hope to materialize is the, the, this idea of the brain telescope, because now anyone can go and look into this data, not just this selected team of subjects that was just put together for this particular uh, um, adversary collaboration project. Now, there is a big challenge, uh, which is the open science challenge. And for that means that we need to go fair. And fair, <laughs> it's in the jargon of the data science, something like it needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And actually, when you try to put that together, it's very difficult <laughs> because it entails something like this. You need to, first of all, go and collect um, metadata. So you need to go, you know, have, have something like an electronic laboratory notebook where what you described and you report the context in which the research uh, was performed. Then you need to have standardized and agree upon ontologies that annotate the data at the relevant level of detail. Um, and this is actually what, we, what makes the data searchable uh, as they can be tagged with any proper label, right? And um, then you, cannot, you also need to track the data lineage. So what, what happened to the data? You know, so what are the different steps and who did what to this data? And on top of that, you need to mount, so to speak, like meta-analytic tools on top of those annotated data or metadata so that you can find information in, the, in this database, right? Think of, you know, like something like a Google Rain. You know? But of course, you need, you know, a, a clouding, <coughs> cloud computing to actually do this. Now, this is the team that actually is trying to make this possible. This is Dan Marcus and uh, Sean Hill. Um, they are, um, they really took on the challenge of, you know, how can we, how can we go from data collection to data discovery? And they are developing XNAT and creating, putting on top of that an electronic laboratory notebook and the elastic search of Blue Brain Nexus to then hopefully allow for data discoveries. And we hope that with this, you and everyone else can actually search into this data. And, you know, and, and our, our vision is that hand, very large, very large scale collaboration will transform our understanding of the uh, human brain and well. Um, but we'll also make our science credible, transparent, open, reliable, and we hope also to strengthen the public trust on our, on the science that we are uh, that we are doing. And and beyond that, we hope that it will also make it cost effective because instead of actually running many 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 you know underpowered studies that may not be reproducible, we hope to you know produce really highly uh, rep uh, um, high quality data sets that will allow us to you know, foster further discoveries. Um, so the, the, the way in which we envisage this is something like a brain telescope, you know, or, or what I call El Alma telescope for the brain. El, El, El Alma is the largest scale telescope that happens to be in Chile, which is where I come from. In essence, it's just a, 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 a many, many sets of you know, like small range telescopes that if they all go into one direction, they can actually look further, right? Um, and the, why, why I'm using this metaphor, because for instance, Maria Geffen uh, from Penn, uh, Panis, uh, Fanis and Yuri Salman, they actually do it. they're also working on a similar adversarial collaboration, now doing, doing something similar, but in animals. So now we can also combine these data sets from human studies to animal studies and you know, probably even enlarge our, uh, um, uh, our knowledge. And if all goes well, I would really hope that one day we can really tackle the hard questions. So why brain are some islands of conscious of, of, of brain activity in, uh, conscious or not? Are 
you know, preterm infants conscious? What happens with twin minds? What happened with octopuses? What happened with brain organoids? What happens, this is something that uh, I know that Lisa is actually working on, what happens with artificial intelligence? Is Siri conscious? Rachel, Samantha, Eva? We don't know, right? We really hope to know the answers. Now, this is all good, but it's actually challenging to do this, guys. It's challenging to do large-scale science. It's challenging to do um, you know, adversarial collaboration for many reasons. Um, first of all, you need to have multiple competences. So you need to have really strong the so-called like neuroinformatics, because you need to curate the data, get the metadata, you need to be able to communicate across the team, work together, and so on and so forth. But also because there is a problem in science, which is the so-called like trait assignment. And this is, and I'm personally very invested with the postdocs in our uh, in our collaboration, because how do you how do you, in this when we end up with a paper with you know like 30, 40 authors, how do you know who did what, right? And how will then tenure uh, committees wait in? Their, con their contribution, you know, for, for their tenure decisions or even for hiring, right? Um, but also you could say, well, actually it's costly because doing team science and actually doing big science and doing open science, so really uh, um, somehow put, you know, putting together the metadata and, and having the data accessible and making them fair, is actually not that simple. So it requires a lot of competences that we're usually not trained on. Um, However, I hope that, you know, even though it's, it has all of these downsides, it also has some positive ends, you know? Um, so, you know, you would say, why, 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 why should you invest in this project and in something else? And, you know, my take on this is because I really think that I hope that through projects such as this one, we will be able to know in which part of the process we are in terms of progress. Are we getting better knowledge, more knowledge, more trustworthy knowledge, which series to invest on? Are we getting closer to understanding the NCC or not? Um, I also hope that we can increase the confidence in the field by just doing these this best practices and you know, like embrace the so-called like radical transparency. Um, and, and, I, and we hope that we are not going to set up only an appro uh, uh, an, a new approach for, for research on consciousness, but I, you know, I, I personally think that any, any field in research will profit from, uh, from studies or, or from the tools that we are developing here, such as adversarial collaboration. Now you would say, well, where are you then? <laughs> well, so this is us uh, almost a year, more over a year ago uh, at the SFN in uh, Chicago, where we actually launched our kickoff meeting. And our project was due to start in January this year. And as we were launching, launching we met, you know, guess what happened, you know? We actually had a huge, huge challenge along the way, which you know, I guess that you're all familiar with. Interestingly enough, it's actually very small, uh, much smaller than a red blood cell, and it's a so-called coronavirus. So I never thought in my entire life that every possible lab around the world could be shut down, but it actually happened. So we have, you know, for many months, even though we were desperate to collect data, we just weren't able to do so. But now we are. So the labs in China are, are open, the labs in the UK are open, the labs in the US are open, the labs in France are open. So now we're finally collecting data. And I hope that in you know, two years time or a year and a half, I will be able to give you that. So, um, but transforming science or the approach that we're trying to take, it really takes a village. So as I said at the start of this talk, I am the one that you're saying now, but actually, it's all of the all of the people in this slide is the ones who are really working hard every day to making this possible and in particular i want to acknowledge the postdocs who i think that are the bravest katarina benz uh, oscar ferrente aya david uh, alex uh, ling um, how ursula uh, chava because you know when you're a postdoc it's very difficult to invest in something when you don't know you know, where you're going to end up with a big publication and something where your name uh, is going to have a prominent place. So I really, um, my chapeau for them for investing in an idea such as this one, uh, because I, I'm, I'm not sure how many people have that courage and that passion. Um, so and with that, I want to thank you for listening to me and the Templeton Foundation for, um, you know, uh, funding this project and for actually even just pushing us into this direction. And um, if you want to join our team, I uh, invite you to um, look into our website. It just launched, or uh, uh, contact us by email. 
uh, in the email that you have there, ircogitate at gmail.com or our website, irc-cogitate.com. So and with that, I want to thank you for listening. I'm super happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Lucia. Um, the audience can't clap, so I'll uh, <laughs> clap for you. Uh, we have several questions and please keep them coming. Um, we also have some really nice comments uh, like uh, very nice science has no borders. So I think uh, people are um, excited about this idea. I'll take the question with the most upvotes uh, so far. So this is uh, Dan Romer asks, it seems that both of your models assume that consciousness depends on connection to the environment with response to stimuli, but this is clearly not the case. How can we study internal consciousness such as in the resting state? This is a super interesting, you know, uh, thank you for that question, Dan. Um, actually, it's not necessarily that uh, the two, the theories assume that consciousness is uh, or has to have external stimulation. It just used them as a way to probe it, right? Um, but of course, a lot of the research is also on trying to under, on, on trying to contrast states. So as I show, for instance, you can have states where you have a REM sleep and you are conscious, where where I'm not probing you whatsoever. I'm just I'm just taking the states in which you are very much aware, and then contrast that with a state in which you are seemingly again sleep, but you have no experience. These two conditions, what you're contrasting is the presence of consciousness versus the non-presence of consciousness, and that is internally generated, right? So we are not being the brain whatsoever, right? Now, for um, practical purposes, you know, and because we want to kind of like have better grip on, um, you know, like a scientist, you know, like you, you can think that you were obsessive compulsive. You know, we want to know like, okay, if I put a stimulus that was green, the, the subject should tell me that it was green. And that's why we ping the system with the particular stimulus and we hope that the subjects will tell us, um, you know, what we the answer that we hope to to see, just to kind of like tweak our measure our measurement. And you can think of that. So one of the main criticisms sometimes that the field of consciousness has is how do you know where someone is just not just lying to you? So imagine, you know, like I present the stimulus and you don't listen, you know, because you are blind, you don't see it. But you tell me, yes, I see it. And, and you know, like how, how will I know? You know, so we try to make all of these, you know, like weird experiments just to kind of like catch our subjects. Like, are you really true? Are you really, you know, like telling me the truth? And, and for instance, to give you an example with people that have synesthesia, in these cases, is completely internally generated. Right? That's why I gave you this example of um, they see the letter A in red, but of course, you and I would see it in, you know, black and white, you know, or whatever the ink was on the on the paper, right? Um, so the experiments that we do to see whether they are really telling us the truth is consistency, for instance. So every time I show you an A, and then I ask you to pick in a palette of color, you pick the same color. Because if you're being random, sometimes you will do green, sometimes you will do blue, sometimes yellow. But if you really see it all the time the same way, then you will have, a, you know, you would, your responses will be consistent. Or, for instance, um, you know, you will have, uh, you, can, you can look into stuff such as priming. For instance, so if we present you something in red, this will affect your posterior behavior only if it was red, but not if it was any other color, right? So at the end of the day, coming back to your question, it's not that we're not interested in the internal consciousness, we are. And that's the real challenge. That's what we really want to understand. But we do all of this, you know, like, <laughs> you know, complexity to kind of like try to get at the question. You know. Thanks. Particular IAT, for instance, is, the, is a theory about mostly phenomenology, right? It's trying to go the other way around. Thanks. Uh, next question, and I promise I didn't plant this one, although I do have some students in the audience. So, um, do you have any philosophy? Do you have any philosophy of mind specialists on your team? Until we find yeah. a way to bridge that gap to some extent, brain imaging can only go so far. I can, you know, I cannot more than agree with that statement. Uh, and I, I, I wouldn't only say that we need philosophies, philo philosophers, which are definitely really important. We need a whole team. I mean, I, I hope that I was able to show that, you know, we need people that point on the hard problems, the philosophers that tell us like, you know what, wait a minute, your logic is flawed. You know, this is, cannot go this way. You also need brain imagers or people who actually have the techniques to really look into the brain or develop new techniques. And you also need data scientists and people who will curate those data so then you can, we can consume it, right? So I, I, my, my take on this is we need this team, this array of people with multiple competences that will tell us, because then again, you know, like I would put it the way around. Imagine that we would have 
only philosophers, but we wouldn't have the tools. Would we go as far? I don't know. You know, so that's why I think that is the is in my view is the synergistic approach, which brings us further, and not anyone. Or I would at least say I like diversity. <laughs> that's what it is like, and inclusion. Yeah. And yes, and you do have some philosophers on your team. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, so, yes, yeah. yes. Well, Francis Fallon, in fact, you know, just to name them, and, and David Chalmers. Both of them are actually in our team. So. Uh, next question. Uh, what if not all the theories on consciousness involved are right and not all are wrong? Does the team have a plan for this situation? And this is qu a question from Jean-Bin Teng. Jean-Bin, hi. <laughs> um, so you say, what if not? Okay, so you're saying, like, what if all of the theories are right? Is that the... I think if I can try to interpret the question, mm -hmm. like maybe there's something partially right to each of the uh -huh. theories. And so there might be complexity in the relationship between the brain and the mind that the yeah. adversarial collaboration doesn't uh, capture. So, so of course, you know, so what we try to do, so this is, this always happens and, and partly happens is that we have currently, some of them are more spread out than others. Um, you know, this is, you know, we, we cannot say that the, you know, Cognitive, new, new cognitive sciences are as developed as, you know, like the particle physics, you know, or something along those lines. So our theories sometimes are not as, you know, clearly defined. Uh, but what we try to do in this particular case is to take the so-called completely opposite predictions. So it is not possible that scenario A and scenario B are possible at the same time, right? And this is really important because otherwise, you know, you end up with, you know, otherwise it doesn't materialize the adversarial collaboration. You know, so you need to find scenarios in which you say, okay, this theory, and this is actually what makes it really hard. And it took us almost a year to just, just get to this, like, okay, what is the minutia that is nonetheless important for the theory, critical for the theory itself? Because if it is like a completely, you know, secondary, third derivative, then who cares? Right, so it has to be critical for the theory, but also has to be incompatible. So either scenario A or scenario B can materialize. Right, so the, our plan was, and this was the whole you know, year, and trying to find only those that were very different. Um, so, you know, but of course data will tell us something different and you know, we will have to reassess for sure. Uh, next question uh, from Marty Seligman. Uh, it would be very helpful to segregate the evidence among one correlates, two necessary, and three sufficient conditions. Uh, Absolutely. I absolutely agree with, with your comment. Um, the program of the NCC, for sure, um, you know, it starts with the correlate, right? Um, and it, it tries to, you know, go and say what is actually necessary, you know? But in, in that, you know, or put it probably in a different way. The brain is complex, so it's not that easy to do this and to really pinpoint. And then you would tell it, well, let's do causal manipulations. Yeah, and people try that, but then guess what? The brain is interconnected. So sometimes you don't know. So okay, and if this is the lastly, you know, like you, so you 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 disconnect the comp the the computer. Then will you say that because you know like the power supply was necessary? You know, so it's, it's just you know it it. I think that and this is not doesn't just apply to consciousness. I think it applies to any of the sciences that we do that our tools are not that easy, you know, and they're not, um, the answers are far more complex than we, than, you know, we hope them to be, right? Um, there is, and there's also, you know, also biology plays tricks. There is degeneracy, there is, you know, like, and there's all sorts of, you know, <laughs> interesting things in, 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 in biological systems. So, yeah, yes, one day <laughs> when we have better tools. Uh, for now, I would just, hope that we have, uh, or, or we'll probably put it differently. What I would minimally be satisfied with is with knowing that we are, have a sure evolution, so to speak, you know, towards the truth, you know, and we're not running circles. That's it, <laughs> you know, right? so no, no, the, but eventually we will want to end up with the full answer. Good, um, so along these lines, uh, Jean Shin asks, uh, what if neural mechanisms of consciousness lie beyond the resolution the techniques you're, uh, of the techniques that your team is using? For example, subcellular, molecular, et cetera. For instance, the microtubule theory by Roger Penrose. Absolutely. So, so it, you know, I mean, or I will, I will probably put it the other way around, right? So we don't know per se the right scale, nor what is the right timing, 
you know, at which, you know, like, uh, 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 um, what is the granularity of the mechanism that will actually explain consciousness? We don't know whether it's a macrotubus, we don't know where it's neurons, we don't know where it's the connectivity. Um, Julio has an interesting paper that I, I you know, I, I recommend everyone to read, which is a so-called like mic micro bits the micro, where where he tries to actually get at this question, like how can we even know? Because in biology, we always have these thousands of things that have changed you know, like atoms, you know, like ke ke chemistry, you know, like the cells and so on and so forth, right? So, you know, for any given change, there has many, many, many different levels at which that change occur, right? So how do we know what is the level I, that is necessary and sufficient <laughs> you know, for an experience? We don't know that, right? And so they, they, and we don't know that in principle, you know, like it's not, it's not a, that's not an easy question. Um, and so they 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 um, they have an, they, they have some ideas as to how to get at that question. Um, so in essence, in, in our uh, project, will never say anything about any other theory. It only says so the scope is far more limited. It only says in this particular case, is IIT right or is GNW right? That's it. Is the microtubule theory you know like the best one? We don't know. You know, and, and I think that it would be illogical for me to conclude <laughs> that just because I'm testing these two, I have anything to say about the other, right? And I hope that, you know, like other teams will be testing the other um, uh, the other theories. And I'm particularly sensitive to the idea of, you know, uh, how can we get to the answers? And that's why we actually went to this arsenal of methods, you know, so ECOG, uh, fMRI, and EEG, and EMG. Because we don't, because every method in human neuroscience is actually in some ways faulty. You know, we don't have the perfect method. You know, so even even if it imagine that it happens not to be the subcellular scale or not the molecular scale, it happens to be like the level of the single neurons in the brain. I don't have access to that, right? So you know, we need more technology. Yes. <laughs> Well, Lucia, thank you so much for a really stimulating uh, talk. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I do want to mention that if you are not done thinking about consciousness, next week, philosopher Tim Bain will be uh, with us and we'll have another discussion about, about consciousness. And we have a great lineup for the rest of the semester, too. So thank you so much, Lucia. Thank you for everyone for coming and asking questions. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao.